professeur Fangas Chavelasco, c'est un professeur de gynécologie obstétrique, c'est le directeur scientifique et médical d'Ivi Madrid. Et nous sommes très, très, toujours avec plaisir qu'on le reçoit parce qu'on apprend toujours avec lui des choses. Et j'espère que ça va vous profiter comme je suis sûr qu'il va nous traiter tous. Donc, à vous la parole. And thank you very much. You have 20 minutes, please. 22, 22. That's what. Merci bien pour la votre euh, présentation et merci bien pour l'invitation à participer à cette symposium à Marrakech. Um, I'll move to English because my French is very limited, but thank you so much for uh, having me here today. And I will try to stick to the 20 minutes that I have to speak about uh, individualized ovarian stimulation, whether it is the present or still the future. The main reason uh, to speak about this is the main reason why we come to meetings. And this is why we come to a meeting. Why are we here today? Because we want to provide better care to our patients, right? We want to improve the success rates. We, we more or less know how to do that, how to make embryos. But we also want to minimize the complications, to increase the efficiency, and to have a better patient experience. And the needs for these patients, for our patients, are not the same. They are different. They change whether we're aiming for a free soul or if we're going to do a PET cycle or maybe a patient with high progesterone. So obviously we have to adapt according to what they need. So I hope by the end of the lecture, you are not on the, on the left side um, sleeping and saying, oh, once again, individualized medicine, so what's new? And more on the, on the other side, saying, oh, wow, this is something interesting that maybe we should aim it for. And individualized care is, is involving many, many areas that you can see in this busy slide is, is taking care, obviously, of diagnostics. We, we individualize the, the tests that we ask for our patients and now moving into genetics and more into uh, multiomics and maybe even AI, artificial intelligence. It's already individualized in the treatments that we apply, as, as we do with ART. We don't do the same treatment for all of our patients. We change surgery, we change uh, even medication. And the potential and the future will be obviously in gene therapy, in vitro gametogenesis, microbiota, who knows? This is still future. But personalized medicine is here. We, we are moving from segmentation. We used to have, let's say, older patients, younger patients, very simplistic, to personalized medicine, which is maybe within the young patients, poor young, uh, young poor responders or um, young uh, good responders, to more hyper-personalization. This is where we are today. Not, not all the poor responders of young age are the same. They are being treated differently according to different biomarkers. So I think today we are happy to have this Poseidon criteria because the Bologna criteria were extremely too tough. They were probably useless. I think nothing that was tried with patients fulfilling the, the Bologna criteria did work. Nothing did work. But Poseidon uh, stratifies in four different groups the patients that have a suboptimal response. And you have clearly these four groups have, first of all, age under 35, over 35. So that's a clear definition. And then you have expected poor responders with low AMH and low AFC or unexpected poor responders in a different age group. So this categorizes four groups that we may uh, do different interventions for different patients. This would be a very simple way to remember where to put our patients. And if we talk about ovarian stimulation, well, we could say we have the ESRA guidelines. This is the holy grail. Everything is written in the book, so why should we bother? Just take the guidelines and do it. But it's not the holy grail. In the ESRA guidelines, if you work within the guidelines, everything is fine. But there are many patients who do not fit in the guidelines. We have patients that are different from the common patient from a randomized trial. And we know that these patients need individualized care. Remember the Optimist trial a few years ago? This is a, a study done in the Netherlands that was uh, trying to randomize patients to either 150 units for everyone versus individualized approach. And the conclusion was it doesn't make any difference. Uh, everyone should be treated exactly the same. But then this paper received a lot of letters uh, criticizing the paper, including one of us that was uh, published also in Human Reproduction. And, and the problem is that they randomized 511 patients to receive, as I said, 150 versus either 225 if they had good antrophological count or 450 if they had a, a, a lower antrophological count. But if you look at the outcome of the paper, you can see lower variability in the number of oocytes retrieved. You can see higher number of oocytes in the poor responder patients. 
you can see lower percentage of poor response, lower risk of cancellation, higher chances of reaching embryo transfer. So there are many reasons to be optimistic. So I, I think the study was slightly biased because it was de designed for failure, to be honest. And we know that these poor subgroups, these four subgroups in the suboptimal patients in the Poseidon criteria, they don't do exactly the same. You can see how the outcome, this is a cumulative uh, pregnancy rate, is going to be different. You have the, in, in dark blue, you have the young, unexpected poor responders, and in green, you have the old, uh, expected poor responders. So they segregate in four groups. So they, they don't act exactly the same. So how can we be good if we want to be good at what we do? Well, you have different options. You can be precise, but not accurate, which is not interesting. You can be accurate, but, but not precise. Um, you can be not precise and not accurate, then you better find another job or you can be precise and accurate. This is what we want, right? And we need to get all sides because the more all sides, the better. And we know this from this paper that we published with Nikos Polizos. We reviewed almost 15,000 patients between Brussels and, and Spain. And if you see uh, this uh, uh, in the light blue, there's a decrease in the pregnancy rate when you have too many oocytes in the first cycle. If you look at the cumulative pregnancy rate, you see that it's almost the same. Even though it seems to increase, there's a certain threshold where you don't get more oocytes. If you look at these two uh, points, for example, you see that even though it seems to be better here, this is just outlier, so it's more unstable. So it seems that after a certain stage, the oocyte that we're retrieving may not be that good. Maybe recruiting from Atresia the wrong ones. This is data from the, uh, Denmark, uh, also presented at ESRI. Again, they showed no benefit beyond 15, even in cumulative. So this is including the frozen. So it seems that up to certain states, the oocytes that we recruit from Atresia are not doing any good. And the reason may be here. Maybe we're getting more oocytes, as you can see, in the, in the bar here, you get more oocytes with more dose of FSH, but you don't get more blastocysts. The, name, the good blastocysts coming from the cycle is more or less the same. So we have to benefit from technology. We have to take advantage of, of the things that we use today. We all have uh, many devices. You all have an iPhone in your pockets. You have uh, computers. So we have to use technology to improve what we do, not only uh, to take pictures, but also to our daily life. And, and this is where biomarkers go into, into life, right? We use today, we don't use any more FSH or estradiol on day three. That's a huge variability there. We all measure until um, follicle count. We, we, it's easy, it's simple, it's cheap. Every one of you have a, a scanner in your office, so you can just put the probe, count the follicles, easy. An extremely robust prediction. If you want, you can use AMH as well. AMH is as robust or slightly better than AFC, but it's more or less the same. And if we talk about quality, those two others, AMH and antifollicle count, is unrelated to quality. Only age, the biological age of this woman, is going to tell us the quality of the egg. So it seems very simple, like, like the plans we all make for our life is simple, but then life gets in the middle and, and things do happen, right? Patients do not respond as we always want. Because there is a huge uh, variability in life. There's a huge variability in biology, and, and this is the problem with reproducibility. If you treat the same patient with the same medication, two cycles apart, she never responds exactly the same. You will have differences. Think about menstrual cycle. We've, we consider normal menstrual cycle from 21 to 35 days. This is a huge variability here, and it's normal. If you talk about the sperm analysis, coefficient of variation up to 30%, and it's normal. You have two samples of a sperm, they fluctuate, and they are still considered normal. Think about progesterone. Dr. Rollins was speaking just now about the fluctuation of progesterone measurements even throughout the day up to 100%. So we live, we live with this. Uh, as I said, if you treat your patient with exactly the same product, with the same patient and the same dose, in three consecutive cycles, you have a 25% cycle variation. So we live, we live with this. There's nothing we can do to change this. Look at this interesting study published in, in Human Reproduction Open. They, they made a model to see what may happen after a second response. And if you had two women with similar age and AMH, two patients with similar biomarkers, one may do nine oocytes. The other one, according to the model, could do from four to 19. There's a huge variation here. If you take the same patient in the second cycle that did nine oocytes in the first, in the second cycle, she may do from five to 17 without changing anything. So. The message of this study was that we truly understand about 
of the fluctuation. The other 80% doesn't depend on us and or, or we do not understand why this happens, but it does happen because we see it on a daily basis. So the problem is, I mean, we, we have to live with this. We have to manage uncertainty. And what level would be acceptable? How much is this going to affect my plans with this patient? Or, or can some of this uncertainty be explained? Well, there's things that we know for sure. We know that we do not want to go this far. We don't want to go to uh, 25 or more than 25 embryos. Why? Because then you have OHSS. And this is a paper from the US 2017, so it's quite recent. And these still are uh, showing patients who are going through paracentesis or even repeated paracentesis. This is something from the past. We don't see OHSS anymore, only anecdotal cases in women who cannot be predictable again. But with agonist trigger, this is something of the past. So why should we go and obtain more than 25 OHSS? No reason for that. OHSS still exists. Here you have the numbers in, in this publication from Fertility and Sterility. You have the severe OHSS in blue. You have the mild OHSS moderate in, in orange. So you still have, even though it's decreasing. But it's very interesting because when we go to meetings or we talk to colleagues, it seems that OHSS we don't have anymore. And if you take data from the newspaper, you see this is the, the percentage of OHSS reported by the clinics in blue is more or less stable, very, very low. But this is the OHSS emergency hospital admissions where you go to a different um, source of information. So it seems that OHSS is very, very underreported. Uh, it seems that cases are happening, but we tend to think that the patient is fine. Maybe the patient goes to emergency, but we don't even notice. And there's also another way, another reason not to give very high doses because this study, for example, showed that it's not the more the better. If you increase the dose, you have lower quality of all This is a study done for all site donors. So these are volunteers. So it's not affecting the medication, the receptivity of the endometrium because this is separated. And it, you can see a 3% decrease in pregnancy rate and live birth rate, 3% decrease for every 500 units that you go beyond the, the, the ideal dose. So if you overdose the patient, you may compromise the quality. So is this the optimal response? A to 14 more or less? We don't want to be here because we might have more difficult uh, a scenario. We don't want to be here because then we're going to have paracentesis and OHSS. Well, theoretically, yes, because this is what we're aiming. We want to have two or three blastoses. This is all we want. If we have two or three blastoses, we're happy because we can try more than once. The patient, if she gets pregnant, she will have one or two more babies. No need to generate too many embryos that we will never use. And to have three or four blastoses, you need more or less this. You need five or six day three embryos or six to seven day two embryos or about 10 to 15 all sets. But is this good for all? Probably not because patients, as I said, are different. It's not the same to have a 28 year old patient called Maria. Maybe she wants to have three babies. She still has no husband and she wants to freeze the all sets for the future. Maybe uh, you have another patient at 36 years of age, Carmen, she has already one child, and she wants to have just one more baby. She doesn't want to have more family. What about Elena at 41? She's uh, advanced maternal age, and she wants to go through PGTA to minimize the risk of miscarriage. How many oocytes do you, do you need with a 41-year-old patient? Or maybe maybe Teresa, which is 31, and she doesn't want to freeze embryos for, for moral reasons. So patient goals are not the same. We cannot have uh, the same target for all of our, all of our patients. So as I said, this ovarian stimulation compromising uh, competence. Well, this uh, classical paper show that if you increase the dose uh, uh, and you have high response, you go from, uh, you can see in the right hand panel, you can see four oocytes in yellow, four to 10, 11 to 20, or more than 20, you see that the fertilization rate is the same. So it doesn't seem to be very complicated up to 20, obviously. There are many, many studies. I won't go through all of them, but just as a summary, uh, when you compare natural cycle versus a stimulated cycle, you see no difference in the aneuploidy rate or the spindle structure of the oocyte, no difference in the embryo composition, no difference in the missed abortion or miscarriage rate, and no difference in the chorionic valley when there are studies. So it doesn't seem to impact the quality at all. The impact comes mainly from the age, and you have seen this graph many times. You can see there is a huge increase beyond 35. Up after 35, you have an exponential rise in a nucleus. So you need more oocytes if you want to have euclid embryos. And here you see that the, the risk or the chances of having one euclid embryo increases with the number of oocytes you get in women over 40. So you have to stimulate patients slightly more or maybe do more than one round of IVF to get euclid embryos. 
But again, high doses does not affect the uplift range. So if you go beyond the, mes the, the dose that you want to give or the, the dose that you were thinking of giving, is not going to compromise the euclid rate. This is a very nice study showing. Uh, here you have the, the euclid rate. This is the group for under 35, 35 to 37, up to 40, or more than 41. And in the color, you see the dosing. This is uh, less than 3,000 units, uh, 3,000 to 5,000, or more than 5,000. And you can see they're absolutely comparable. They, they only decrease because of the age of the patient, not because of the dosing. And the same with the response here, you see in, in 35 up to 41, again, whether it's 1 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 15, or more than 15, you have exactly the same u rate. So it's not related to the dose, it's not related to the response, it's related to the age of the patient. Whether the oocytes come from the luteal phase or the follicular phase, again, it doesn't make any difference. You have data from Filippo Baldi and from many other groups, including ours where the oocytes that you obtain in the luteal phase stimulation have the same UPD rate as the follicular phase. And you have ways to assess this. There's new, new, new ways to assess that you have the, the FORT or the FOI, you know, the, the, the ovarian sensitivity indexes that can help us to understand what is happening, especially the, the follicular to oocyte ratio or the follicular output ratio. These are interesting uh, patients that sometimes we see a lot of antral follicles that they don't make follicles or they don't make oocytes. And this is what has been published so far, when you have a, um, what they call a, a follicle to oocyte ratio. So follicles that are developed over 16 divided by the oocyte, you get under 50%. You may need to adjust the protocol or you may need even to do a genetic screening of these patients. The genetic screening is not done routinely. It's quite expensive. When we talk about polymorphisms, we don't do it routinely. But you have uh, data showing that, you know, according to these polymorphisms, whether they have serine or arginine, you know that you may have uh, to need higher doses when you have these polymorphisms, but remember that polymorphisms are related to the geographic area. So that means that in this uh, nice paper from Manuela Simoni, you can see that the distribution of the SNPs, the variation of these polymorphisms changes. So maybe what works in Brazil doesn't work in Morocco, or maybe doesn't work in Spain or in the Philippines. So every population is different. Remember that because this is, we try many, many times to compare between us many things. And sometimes we have to be specific with the population that we treat. Here you have another demonstration by, by the group in, the, in, in Denmark showing that with different fluctuations in the SNPs, you will have different pregnancy rates. So it is obviously related. We did a study, a very simple study, trying to correlate the, the SNPs variation in the FSH receptor, as you can see here, and the LH receptor in almost 300 patients and try to correlate that with the AMH concentration to see if we could identify which patients may benefit from screening. We did these 300 patients looking at, as I said, as the SNPs. Oops, sorry. And we couldn't find any, any correlation at all. So the message was, we don't need to screen to the general population for polymorphisms, maybe in those cases that they have a, a suboptimal response. And finally, uh, we are moving into the genetics. We uh, come to meetings, we hear about genetics continuously. We go out there to have a coffee and you have genetic companies. and. This is a very recent paper from Science, a very good journal, showing what are the already defined mutations that compromise fertility. So in the era where we are now, in, in, in 2023, we know that the exome data is coming soon. We, we have the, a huge amount of data that we will have problems trying to manage so much information, but it may give us at a very cheap price very soon the identification of issues that may compromise fertility in a couple. And here you have many, many mutations that compromise fertilization of the oocyte, um, arrested maturation in the sperm, arrested embryos in the development, different areas. I don't want to bother you with all of them, but uh, I think it's a very interesting review to understand that maybe very soon when you have a couple in front of you, before going into repeated treatments and failures, maybe we can tell them the first day, listen, you have this mutation, your oocytes will never fertilize, you may need ICSI, or maybe you will have an embryonic arrest and you may need another therapy. So finally, to conclude, Mr. Chairman, two simple messages. First of all, when we try to stimulate our patients, I, I think we have to be clear with the expectations. We cannot overestimate um, what we do, and we cannot generate follicles that are not there. If we do a scan and we don't see answer follicles, or we see two answer follicles, we will never have 10. We will have two. So we cannot generate these follicles, and, and we have to, to be very realistic with the expectations. And second, we have to avoid the illusion of control. We, we doctors tend to think that we have the joystick, we can do anything. 
And the truth is that we should avoid overestimating the effect of our interventions. Even if we change things, many of this variability does not depend on us. And of course, I, I, I'm a fully believer on, on individualized medical treatment. I think a stratification of patients with suboptimal prognosis will help us to maximize the reproductive outcome. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Juan, for the timing also. Est-ce que vous voulez poser des questions au professeur Velasco? Yes, professor Velasco, thank you for your excellent uh, talk. My question is about personalization. I don't believe a lot that it exists if we, we don't talk to high responder. But in the other groups, for example, even if we believe that when we, we give high doses, there is the, 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 the rate of pregnancy is better, but the, the data are here. Even if a lot of experts don't, don't believe in this data, the guideline are here is here, and the the they, they say to us not move more than 150. In in these cases, what we need to have more biomarkers or uh, other uh, thing to individualize the stimulation, this kind of group. Thank you. That's a very good question because I, I completely agree with you. In, in hyper responders, you can titrate the dose and individualize. If you're aiming for a fresh transfer, if you're aiming for a frozen transfer, it's less of a worry, but, but you can do that. But in the low responders, I think the key for success and the individualized care is not giving high doses. I, this is particular individualized treatment because if you give them 600 units, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of medication, and it's not improving, as you just correctly said, that, that it's going to have any better pregnancy rate. So you have to probably minimize the amount of medication, or you may be uh, offering this patient alternative treatments like a combination with, with clonifen or letrozole combined with HMG, trying to, because as I said, if you see three follicles and you have a very low AMH, you want to have a very poor response. So you have to, first of all, inform the patient, and second, not overdose the patient with extra medication that it will be a waste. But I think this is part of the individualized care. Yes. Thank you, Yuan, for a very interesting talk, as usual. So, you mentioned clear. Plus fort, Samir, s'il vous plaît. Sorry? Plus fort, s'il vous plaît. Uh, thank you, Yuan, for a very interesting talk, as usual. So, you mentioned clearly the variation between intra and intracycles. So, maybe it's time to rethink about day two, day three, day four before starting, because uh, as you mentioned, with the same protocol from cycle to another cycle, the ovarian response is not the same. So maybe it's time to rethink before to start to cancel the cycle or to go in order to avoid, for example, to consume 600, 700 euro and to stop uh, the protocol. What yeah. do you think about? Yeah, that's a good point because, um, you know, the thing when we change med medications from cycle to cycle, if the patient improves the response, the patient is very happy and we are very happy and, and they think we're great. But if you change the protocol and the patient diminishes the response, the patient will think, well, we did uh, something wrong and we are very frustrated. But the truth is that fluctuation exists. So I completely agree with you. I think we we ideally should start cycles when when we want to start cycles. We know we can start cycles almost any day. Now. There's no need to wait for menstruation, but we still do. We still are very classic and the same. We start on day two, day three. But in the first scan, day four, day five, you're going to have a clear picture of what's happening. If you see the cohort of follicles moving, continue, or maybe it's not a good cycle and it's much better, you suggest that you cancel because otherwise you're going to spend the whole amount of medication, 10 days with three, four scans, medication, and at the end of the cycle, you're going to cancel. And that's a waste at, at the end of the day. And, and it doesn't matter if it's the patient paying from the pocket or if it's the NHS or the, uh, uh, the state or the, the country paying for it because it's a huge amount of money. And we are used to, well, these are expensive drugs, so this is what it is. Well, we can do better than that. If you think of what you can do with that amount of money in your normal life, it's a lot of money. But I think we should be careful of this. And again, I think this is personalized care, not putting everyone on the same protocol, wait for 10 days for cancellation, maybe an early decision is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the last question here. Thank you for excellent topic. Uh, my question is, according to age under 35, maybe, and up to 35 old, and considering the output rate uh, follicles, 
the, the fourth index, which strategy or what, what the strategy do you adopt for these two persons? Uh, if I understood correct, you were asking about the women under 35 uh, with a good uh, biomarker uh, and what will be the strategy to stimulate the patient? Yes. Okay. Well, in, if, in, a, in a very simple way to express it, if the patient is under 35 with a good um, prognosis, we will use only recombinant FSH and antagonist protocol. And if the patient is going to go for a fresh transfer, we use HCG. If she's going to freeze for any reason, or it's assessed, PTA, whatever, we do agonist trigger only. If the prognosis is poor, in a women under 35, we use a combo approach. We always use HMG. And the reason is that by when you age in the ovaries, you reduce your androgen concentration. And if you reduce the androgen, you will have less estrogens, which is not good. So by adding HMG with LH activity, you will increase the androgens and you will increase the estrogen production. So under 35, good prognosis, only recognizes antagonist. Uh, poor prognosis under 35, combo protocol. And beyond 35, always combo protocol. Thank you, Juan, for a nice talk. Thank you.